Did you hear a pin drop? Thought I did. Good morning, everybody. What a wonderful day it is. We're going to have a potluck over at Ron and Louise's afterwards. That's exciting. We have a nice service plan for you today. A nice message about finding God in a world that's gone wild. Hey, that sounds like today. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Anyway, we're going to start with some worship right now. Here's what we're going to do. Let's stand together as we sing more love, more power. Here we go. Lord, I just pray that you would bless this service today. 
and just touch it, Lord. We pray for an anointing that, that you would open the hearts of everyone, that they would receive things, Lord, a message on them. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity of being able to serve, and we just thank you how everyone has come together to greet you, Lord, and seek you with a whole heart. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here we go, people. Come and see that presence like this. Oh, <laughs> 
a prayer. Here is our heart. Sing again. Merciful Savior, gracious Redeemer, so in your anger, rich in your love, full of compassion, longing to Here is my heart, Lord. chapter 8, verses 33 through 39. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Is it God that justifieth? Who is he that commanded? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 8, verses 33 through 39. Praise the Lord. Nothing will separate us. No tribulation or anything. We are in the tribulation today, and we're talking about finding God in a world gone wild. We can do it. God is there for the ones who love him and believe in him. We're going to go ahead and can we have our ushers come up today? We're going to have our time of giving and I pray that you give with a whole heart. And we're going to sing a hymn right now called Gentle Shepherd. <laughs>
it's time for Ron and Louise to come up here. Uh -huh. first time. We're going to have a little giveaway. Yeah. A little five dollar giveaway. Obviously, there's a couple people missing on this five dollar yeah. giveaway today. Are you here? Raise your hand here. six miles to Lake Creek Drive. You turn right on Lake Creek Drive. That's right across from Horse Creek Fruit Stand. Okay. On Lake Creek Drive, you go a great big distance of about less than a quarter of a mile. Where the first house on the left. Not hard to find. It's easy to get lost. <laughs> okay, six miles on Peoria, Lake Creek Drive, turn right, first house on the left. You'll cross one bridge before you get to our house, and then our house is right there. Okay. Any questions? You all coming? Yeah! Okay. All right, thank you, Ron. We're looking forward to it. Yeah, it's pretty easy to find. You shouldn't have any trouble, so. Right now, it's time to stand up and greet one another. Children, excuse the Children's Church. And we'll be started in just one moment. Make somebody welcome. Thank <laughs> you. 
gave his testimony, and he said, I'm a millionaire, he said, and I attribute it, it all, all of it, to the rich blessings of God in my life, and I can still remember the turning point in faith like it was yesterday. He said, I just earned my first dollar, and I went to church meeting that night, and the speaker was a missionary, and he told all about his work, and I knew that I only had a dollar bill, that either I would either have to give it all to God's work or nothing at all. So at that moment, I decided to give my whole dollar to God. And I believe that God blessed that decision, and that is why I am a rich man today. 
And as he finished, it was clear that everyone was really moved by this man's story. But as he took his seat, this little old lady was sitting in the pew right beside him. And she leaned over and said, that was a wonderful story, but I dare you to do it again. <laughs> I thought that was cute. <laughs> Let's start up with a word of prayer. Here we go. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you, Lord. We're so thankful that we can come together and seek you and learn more about you, Lord. I just pray that you would just anoint this message, that it would touch people's hearts, and that they would get something out of it, Lord, that they would be able to take with them in their life. Not only just seeing the future as we are here, but how we can apply things to our life, Lord. And we just... Thank you for the opportunity to share, and I just thank you for the words that you've given me, and I just pray, Lord, that you would just anoint them and just touch everybody's life here and just bless it in a big way. And so we thank you. We turn everything over to you right now again, Lord, and ask for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're in Revelation 9. We are in the first three and a half year period, and the uh, second starts, the second three and a half year period starts in chapter 11. Now that's a no-brainer, I mean it's just obvious right there, chapter 11. And so we see that that's the case. And in a moment we're going to be looking at chapter 9 verse 13, and we are going to be in the second of the woes. Now remember that we are in 9 verses 13 through 21, and uh, it seems like right now everything is just kind of a mess. It seems like everything is, that's not nailed down is coming loose. And it seems that the devil is pulling nails every day. And here we have a world that is literally a world that has gone wild. Now we ask this question, where's God? You know, doesn't he know about this? And if he does know, doesn't he care? That's like today, so many. Or they say, or if he does know and cares, and maybe he can't do anything about it. Well, the title of the message today is Looking for God in a World That's Gone Wild, and we are going to find out that God does know, and God does care, and God does have a plan. Now, we've been studying that period of time that's coming on the earth known as the Great Tribulation, and it is delineated in the book of Revelation by the opening of seven sealed book. There's a scroll that's opened up. You'll break a seal, open up some more, break a seal, open up some more. And we see the seals as they're broken and the book is open. The horrors of the Great Tribulation start to unfold before our eyes. So remember that there is those seven seals and one by one we've seen those seals open. And the book is completely unsealed right now. Now we've opened the seventh seal and we saw that the seventh seal last week there was that big moment of silence. But then we have the seven trumpets that begin to sound. Now, they do not bleed into each other. So we first of all have the seals, and now we are in the trumpets. So we have trumpets, seven trumpets that begin to sound. Now, a trumpet in the Bible is, would be used to give an alarm, much like an air raid siren or a burglar alarm. And it tells of some impending danger that's coming. And we see trumpets sound many times in the Bible. And so here there's these seven trumpets right after the seventh seal is opened. And there was the seven angels that blew these seven trumpets. And we've worked all the way down through the first five trumpets. And we come today to the sixth trumpet, which happens to be the second woe. Remember the first four trumpets was judgment on material things, on the ocean, I mean on the sea, and on the land, and on things, on green things, on things on the earth. And the last three trumpets are on moral things. We hit the fifth trumpet, which is the first of the last three trumpets, and it was the beginning of the first woes. We have three woes that are in these last trumpets, the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. The fifth trumpet was the first woe, and it was the demonic locust. We talked about that last week. I can't get into it today. Now remember, there are three woes, the fifth and the sixth and the seventh trumpet. Each one are demons being loosed. So we saw that the locusts were loose last time. We're going to pick it up right there. We're going to start in Revelation chapter 9, verses 13 through 21. And you would read along with me. And we're going to pick it right up on this second, the second woe. Here we go, 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Okay, saying to the sixth angel which has the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Okay, so they're loosening some more angels, the four angels that are bound in Euphrates. 
And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay a third part of men, a third of mankind. And the number of the army of horsemen were 200,000 thousand. That's 200 million. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire, and of jacinths, and brimstone, and heads of horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire, and smoke, and brimstone. By these three was the third of all men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. That's war, people. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold or silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither they repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. Okay, so right there we see 200 million we're talking about. Now there, I think there are five factors that I think are delineated here and stuff. And really there's many more obviously, but there are five factors that I've chosen today to lay upon your heart as we are looking for God in a world that's gone wild. Now, if we today are wondering where is God so often, I wonder how much more they will be going through the great tribulation, those that are going to be wondering. And by the way, I want to say it again, that the church is not going to be here during the great tribulation. I mean, as we understand the word of God, we're going to be raptured out first, as we see in so many places, Thessalonians, Corinthians, chapter 4, and Revelation. And there is coming a day that some will be entering into this tribulation because they refuse to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So factor one, I want to call the prayer factor. And here is the prayer factor. On your outline, first thing, prayer delayed is not prayer denied. Okay? You know, sometimes we pray and pray and pray and nothing happens. And we think, well, perhaps God didn't hear our prayer. Or God heard our prayer and he just said no. But let's look again. Let's look at verse 13 in this chapter 9 that we're looking at as we break this down. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Now, what is that golden altar before God? Well, in heaven, there is a tabernacle. And let me explain about the tabernacle on earth that the children of Israel worshipped in, because it was nothing but a symbol and a picture or a type of the tabernacle, which is in the heavens. And in the tabernacle in heaven, there's this golden altar there. And the golden altar on earth represented that altar. And it was called the altar of prayer. Now, we need to understand how the tabernacle works a little bit. Now, as you came into the tabernacle in the Old, in the Old Testament, the first thing that you would see would be a great brass altar, the brazen altar. And the fires of that altar are continually burning day and night and night and day. They go continually. Because these fires represented the holiness of God and his judgment against sin. God is always holy. God doesn't sleep. God is always holy. So that fire needed to be burning constantly. There would be a blood sacrifice offered on that brazen altar to get you in. That's how you get in. He died for our sins. He got you in through, with the blood. And that altar of judgment represents the Lord Jesus Christ dying for our sins to get you saved. And that was in the outer court of the tabernacle. But then, if you were to come into the inner court, you would find the golden altar. So first of all, you get saved, you come in, you enter in, and then your prayers are heard. See how that works? And so then when you come to the golden altar, it is the altar of incense. And when you come to the inner altar, I mean, inner court, you see that golden altar there. It's the altar of incense with four butubrances that come out of it, which basically are the horns one on each corner, and the horn speaks of power. Remember that. We've talked about that. Once a year, the high priest would take the blood and go on, the day of, on the Day of Atonement and go on into the Holy of Holies, and there he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. 
and that blood represents Christ as the propitiation and the satisfaction for our sins, everything. But let's think about that, the golden altar again, for just a moment. We've spoke of this before many times, but let's look at it again, because this time a voice is coming from the four horns. Now, once a year, the high priest would come into the Holy of Holies, and he would sprinkle the blood on the four horns of the golden altar that burned incense. And he would burn incense on that golden altar in the morning and in the evening. And, but what does that represent? Well, it represents our prayers, truly, how they go to heaven with the power of the blood. You see that? How they go to heaven with the power of the blood. And so you see there is this power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only to cleanse us from sin, but to give ecstasy, or I mean to our prayers, to, to make it effective, you know, ecstasy. And then the priest would sprinkle incense on the fire of the golden altar, and then the incense would go up to heaven in the power of the blood, representing your prayer and my prayer. And that's how it worked in the Old Testament. We don't have to do that anymore. We got Jesus. Yes. <laughs> Praise yes. the Lord. Yes. But let's look at it for a minute here. Let's look at chapter 5. You don't have to turn there. Don will turn there. Chapter 5, verse 8. And I want to show you just a couple things. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors which are the prayers of the saints. Golden vials, full of orders, prayers of the saints. And I'm not guessing at this. This is, I'm not kidding. In Psalm 141, 2, did I give that to you? Oh, gee. Okay. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. That's what it says in Psalm 141, verse 2. So incense represents prayer. Now, I went all through that before. Now, the question is, why, oh, why are our prayers so long and being answered sometimes. Well, you know, that's not a new question. <laughs> that's an old question. Let's take a look. We'll move up into Revelation 6 and look at verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, these are the souls under the altar, and you can see them. And they're beloved Christians on, uh, who loved Jesus and they stood on the word of God and they preached and they taught and testified until they were put to death for it. And keep looking at 10 and 11 in that same chapter 6. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwelleth on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants, Gentiles, and their brethren, Jews, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Oh my goodness gracious. Now this is interesting. White robes are given to the saints when they get their bodies. So they've obviously got their bodies restored. And these saints are in heaven saying, God, why haven't you answered our prayers? And God says, now just wait, just wait. It's not over yet. There's going to be some more people martyred. Where's God? You, God, you've got to save those martyrs. No, no, he doesn't do that. God lets things play out. Those are rewards for people if they allow themselves to be martyred for the, for the cause of Christ. And rewards are given to the saints that do these remarkable things. And so sometimes God just doesn't come in to save these martyrs because there's another plan going on. I've said it so many times. God works all things out for good for those who love the Lord. Sometimes it takes a long time to work it out because he's working on somebody else. And our job for, is to wait on the Lord. Constantly waiting on the Lord because his plan is perfect and he has it all figured out. He knows what he's going to do. And this time you have to wait. And so we do. And the martyrs have to wait because there's going to be some others that are martyred. Now, we must understand that prayer delayed is not prayer denied. And what I want us to see in a world gone wild is that God has his own schedule. But you must remember that if you prayed in faith and asked God to do something, then that prayer never fell to the ground. That prayer is still there in heaven. Now, again, let's go ahead and read Revelation 8.3 as we move on that. We're getting back to 9. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints.
upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Did you see that? All saints. Don't you love that? That's me and you. All saints. Are you a saint? If you're a believer, if you're saved, born again, you're a saint. And so her prayers are up there, and their prayer is there, because it says that all saints. And so your prayers did not fall to the ground, and God knows your heart. And it says um, that we need to learn that prayer delayed is not prayer denied. And you know, it makes me think of a story about Ron Dunn. He was a preacher that I heard of and talked about before. And he had gone to heaven already. And he said, prayer is the Christian secret weapon. Well, we know that. It's like an intercontinental ballistic missile. And I want to give it. I love this part. Here's five points that I want to tell you about prayer. Number one, he said, it can be fired from any spot. It can be fired from any spot. You know, I heard one preacher that when he gets a new believer and he takes them outside of his office and he points at a spot and he tells them, do you see that spot right there? And they say, yes, what about it? And he said, I can go any place in the world from that spot. <laughs> they say, you can? He said, yes, any place in the world from that spot. Now, that kind of sounds funny, but you can. You can go anywhere in the world from any spot. Friend, let me tell you something, that you can launch a prayer from any spot on earth and from any place. And you know what will happen? This is what it does. Number two on your own, and it'll travel undetected at the speed of light. It does. And friend, I don't know where heaven is and how far away it is, but your prayer can reach heaven just like that. Number three, it hits the target every time. Yes. I mean, every time it is accurate. Number four, Satan has no defense against it. There is no anti-prayer missile. Now, that was different in the Old Testament. We, like we've seen in Daniel. Remember, it took him 21 days to get an answer to prayer. He was wondering. He couldn't hear from God. But they were busy fighting. We'll talk about that in a second. Because they, now we're in the New Testament that the war was won at Calvary. Our prayers go right through any time. But in the Old Testament, there was wars and battles going on. Number five, it often has a delayed detonation. It often has a delayed detonation. So when you say, oh, Lord, why haven't you heard my prayer? Listen, you hit the target. You just got to wait. That's all. And these souls that are at the altar are saying, oh, Lord, how long? God says, I'm right on schedule. And it will go off right on time. And we see that prayer can be launched with... Uh, that uh, with a delayed detonation. Sometimes, you know, I prayed and prayed and prayed, and then it's like we've talked about that a rock hitting the, I mean, a hammer hitting the rock, a little hammer, after a thousandth time or something, it breaks. Which one broke it? The first one or the last one, you know? All of them, you know? And prayer hits, even though you don't know it, but you're chipping away at that. So keep praying for those pointed prayers. So, you know, you say, why haven't you hit the target, or why haven't you answered my prayer? Well, you see that uh, God says, you hit the target, you just have to wait. So the first principle and the first prayer that I want you to see is the prayer factor, and the prayer delayed is not prayer denied. Okay, now the second one, number two, the power factor. Now listen, Satan is sinister, but God is sovereign. Sovereign, never forget that. Don't get your eyes on Satan and get the idea that God is up there wringing his hands, walking around saying, what am I going to do now? I told you before that the Holy Trinity never meets in emergency sessions because God is sovereign. He is in control. I mean, let's go back to chapter 9. I want to show you something in verse 14. You should have it open. Saying, the sixth angel which had the trumpet loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now this voice that we see that speaks comes from the altar. And that means it's coming as an answer to your prayers. God is using the enemy, these four angels bound in the river Euphrates. You see how he used the locust last week? He called them out of there and stuff. And this is the four angels that are bound in the river Euphrates. And I think that these are four of the most vile, wicked, powerful, all demonic, fallen angels ever. And I call them the filthy four. And God's going to use them now on the people. And God has had them bound. And God has had them chained. And God has had these vile, malevolent, wicked angels on a leash and restraining them. And they, have, they seem to have charge now, as they did in the past over the four world empires. 
that have been on the earth. Remember Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, and Rome. Remember the story of Daniel and stuff. Those were the four great empires that, that, that they ran. Now, they were what we would call prince angels. These are archangels, and we have seen that there are prince angels. There's good ones and bad ones. And as we look at Daniel, by the way, you have to understand Daniel to understand Revelation. And vice versa. We're going to be going through Daniel and stuff when we start up on Wednesdays. I have a couple of Revelation things, but we're going to be starting up in September, and I'm going to be going through Daniel. Now remember, Daniel prayed, and he wondered why his prayer wasn't answered immediately, and the angel came to him and said this. Let me go back to Daniel, and let me show you something here. In uh, chapter 10 and verse 13, I want to show you. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me, one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And so I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now we see here that, um, that the prince of the kingdom of Persia was stood in for one and twenty days. Twenty-one days. So twenty-one days I've been doing battle with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Who was the prince of the kingdom of Persia? Well, it certainly wasn't a man. He can't do battle with a man. A man can't do battle with an angel. And I believe that the prince of the kingdom of Persia is one of the four angels that are bound up here. Let's read on and read Daniel 10, 20 and 21. Don should have there, okay? Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now I will, will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece shall come. Now remember, Persia came and Greece came with Alexander the Great, came over and took over everybody. But I will show thee in 21 that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. Now Michael is the prince angel. He is the main one. He is like in charge of so many of the battles and things. We know that we're talking about prince angels when we talk about Michael. And we're talking about good and bad prince angels. And we know that Michael, the prince is of the people of God, and he is especially the Israel's prince. He is a prince for the nation of Israel. And there again, he mentions the prince of Persia. But also he mentions the prince of Greece now, didn't he? Now, that helps us to understand what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 6, 12, when he says, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with what? Principalities. There are evil, wicked, vile princes, and I mean they're cheap and ruling demons who rule over world empires. Now, that's the reason that sometimes negotiators cannot do what they're trying to do because they're negotiating with men who are being controlled by demonic spirits. There's a specific plan going in the kingdom, too. I mean, in the evil kingdom. And you can't negotiate with Satan. So these filthy four, these four angels, I believe, are the prince angels, and they are bound up in the river Euphrates, and they're loosed. Now, the river Euphrates is both on your outline, the cradle and the grave of human civilization. Now, if you read the book of Genesis, you're going to find out that the river Euphrates flowed out of the Garden of Eden. And it was there that the first sin was committed. And it was there that the first murder was committed. It was there that the Tower of Babel was built. And it was there on the shores of the Euphrates where the city of ancient Babylon was built. And it was right after the flood, it was there that Nimrod was a type and a picture and an illustration of the Antichrist who is to come. He ruled there. Now, Nimrod means rebel. And he's the one who built the Tower of Babel and the First World Empire. <coughs> Excuse me. So I say again that the river Euphrates is the cradle and the grave of civilization. Now it is the river that divides, on your outline, the Near East from the Far East. It divides the Near East from the Far East. And we always say East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Well, twain is two. Never the two shall meet. Well, one of these days in the Great Tribulation, they will meet these demons and these spirits, and evidently there is only so much now that they can do because God is sovereign and God has restrained these four prince angels in the river Euphrates. But there will come a time when God is ready, like Bill always says, in the fullness of time to let them be released. And folks, when that happens, I don't want to say it flippantly, but all hell is going to break loose. I mean... Listen, don't ever get the idea that Satan can do whatever he wants when he wants. 
cannot. No. The Bible says that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And so God allows Satan to do certain things. And you know, Satan wanted to sift Peter as wheat, but he could not do it until he got God's permission to sift Simon Peter. God said, okay. And he did do that because Peter denied God, and that's how Satan works. Well, Satan wanted to harm Job, and he had to get God's permission to harm Job. God said, okay. But Job was faithful, wasn't he? And what I'm trying to say is this, that Satan is on a leash. And because Satan is still in some measure restrained, and I don't even think that Satan even really knows it. And so we see that Satan is sinister, but God is sovereign. But you need to understand that God allows Satan and his demons to test you. And the truth is that trials in your life is the testing time. So when you're getting angry and bitter, you can know that Satan or his demons are right there tempting. They can't get in you. They can't possess you. But they can sure tell you that's not fair. And they can get in your life and make it horrible because you're saying, you deserve better than that. They can do all kinds of things in your heart and mind. And faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. And we need to know that there will be trials in our life. Sometimes people think that there's some sort of an equilibrium and over here is God and over here is Satan and there's this great battle going on between God and Satan and we're waiting to see who will win. But don't ever get that idea in your head because Satan is a created being. He may be sinister, but only God is sovereign. But there's the third factor I want you to learn and that's the purpose factor and it's this. Here we go. Now listen, with God on your outline, timing is more important than time. Timing is more important than time. Now, that's very important that you learn this. Look what it says in verse 15, in chapter 9, verse 15. It says this, <clears throat> And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of man. Now, you might look at that and you might say, well, that means... 13 months in a day as you add it all up and everything. But the Greek, it reads differently. It says prepared for the day, the hour, the year. So it's the day, the day, not a day. And it's the day, listen to this, that one-third of the people on earth are killed. So after losing, figuring on an average of 6 billion, I think there's more like 7 billion, but let's figure 6 billion after losing 1.5 billion, one quarter of mankind in Revelation 6. We have four and a half billion left. And then one third of four and a half billion is one and a half again. And so we see that right now. So that's one third, one and a half billion. So now we've got three billion left. So you take any figure and take one fourth of that. And then you take what's left and you take one third of that. You have basically split it all in half. And so that's what you have. Three billion left. Now I want to tell you one more time. We're still in the first three and a half years. We haven't got to chapter 11 yet. We're in the first three and a half years. Anybody that believes in mid-tribulation mid that we're going to go through the first three and a half years, whew, I feel sorry for you. We started with 6 billion, so now we see we got 3 billion left. Look at 915. Not a composite of days, but a specific day, a pinpoint. And what that tells us again is that God has a purpose and that everything is under God's control. Until that specific horn or until that moment, it cannot happen. And he will not let them loose. And I mean until that specific hour strikes. And what does this verse tell me then? What does it tell us? Not a speck of dust moves in the universe without God giving it permission. Amen. Because God is in control. I mean, not a blade of grass moves in the wind without God's permission. God is strategically moving in the world at his own timing. That's being a part of the will of God is being in his timing, not your timing. And it's like this, God called Abraham. God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you the land, this land in Canaan. And God said to Abraham, but oh, it's going to be 400 years before your people are going to go in it. And he says, how come? Well, listen to this, God explained it to Abraham. He said, because Abraham, the land is full of Amorites, and the iniquity of the Amorites is not full enough yet. They're not bad enough yet. So he's waiting for them to get bad enough. 
The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now that is very interesting because we see drop by drop by drop they are putting iniquities in the reservoir of God's wrath and God says, I am waiting and I'm going to be waiting for 400 years. And again we see God knows the future and he is going to bring this Jewish victory into the land and the Amorite judgment together. Because God is working all things out that are bad or good for all those who love the Lord all the time. And so why is he waiting? Because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. People are filling up their cups of iniquity too. And you think how long they were under the altar. People prayed for the coming Messiah. All kinds of people. And a lot of them that prophesied the Messiah over and over again that he'd come. They said, how long will it take before Messiah finally comes? How long, Lord? We see in the Galatians tells us the answer. And it says, in the fullness of time. So it shows that there is a fullness. God has a timing plan and stuff. And God sent forth his son at that time, but the world had to be ready. Notice how the world had to be ready, but God hadn't spoken to the people for about three or 400 years. So they were really ready then. And so you see, God is never ahead of time. God is never late. In 2 Peter 3, it tells us that in the last days that are some are going to be saying, I mean the unsaved, where's the promise of his coming? Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And they say, he's not coming. But Peter says in 2 Peter 3, for this they are willingly ignorant. 2 Peter 3, verse 8 tells us that one day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. We see that in Psalms too. And that tells me that, friend, God doesn't punch a clock. That God, that when he goes to work, God is, has a certain time plan. And one day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. But also in Peter 9, it says this, in verse 9 in Peter, excuse me, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. He's not slack in his promises. His long-suffering to us for it shows us that he's not willing for any to perish, ever. He's not willing for any to perish. A lot of people believe in this predestination for even the unsaved, that they were just never meant to be saved. No, God has called every single person, and when they don't make it, it'll be their fault. That's right. It's, it's a fact, and that the day of the Lord will come, and you can bank on it, because it will come, and God keeps his word. And just because it's been 2,000 years since our Lord stepped out of heaven, don't get the idea of one iota, one celatella of a second in your mind that God has forgotten his promise. No, as surely as I'm standing here, one day the trumpet will sound and the sky will roll back and Jesus will rise from his throne and step down to receive his own. And the Bible ends with, even so, come, Lord Jesus, because he is coming. He is coming. And I want you to notice the purpose factor. God's timing is more important than timing. And so we see God has a purpose and God is controlling this world. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is, well, usually everyone I'm preaching on is my favorite scripture, but one of my favorite scriptures is in Timothy <laughs> chapter 6, you know, verses 14 and 15, when he says this, listen, <clears throat> that thou keep his commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, that means supreme being, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So it's on God's time and his time is definitely coming. And with the day and with that hour or that month, he is going to be right on time. Now, if you want to know where is God, well, I'll tell you where he is. God is on time and God is coming. And so we see with God, timing is more important than time. Okay, here next, we're on the fourth factor. I want to call it the perversity factor. It talks about sin. And here it is, number four, when restraint is removed, battles begin. Battles begin when restraint is removed. Look what it says in chapter 9, verse 6. It says this, 16, excuse me. And the number of army of horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard them. I heard the number of them. Now, why did John write that? I heard the number of them. Well, when John saw this revelation, there wasn't 200 million people even on the earth. They weren't even there. 
And it talks about the army of 200 million. Now, somebody probably says, well, John, did you get your decimal point in the wrong place? And he said, I heard the number, though. And so let's carry on, 17 through 19. Thus and thus I saw horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire, and jacents and brimstone, and heads of horses were as the heads of lions. Out of their mouths issued fire, smoke, and brimstone. Now when you look at this, I want you to think about somebody out of the Old West or something looking at modern warfare. So try to look at modern warfare and put those in there and think about them in that light. Verse 18, by these three was the third of part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstones which issued out of their mouths. Sounds like bombs coming from tanks and things. For their power is in their mouth and their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents that had heads and with them they do hurt. Now when these vile angels these filthy four, I mean the prince angels that are released from the river of Euphrates, what happens is then that God takes them off the, the leash out of them. And they are no longer restrained, and they are stirring up hate, hatred in men. That's what they do. Now that's what they will do, and that's what they did on the old kingdoms. And that's why the kings were in charge. They had a specific angel in them, because one man could just be detrimental for the nation. And then an incredible battle begins, but it's not the battle of Armageddon. We're far from that. It is setting the stage for Armageddon. Now, a violent war inflames the wicked hearts of men and by demon spirits. And so you see that Satan is a devil of war. And what he really loves is humans fighting humans. When you're in an argument at home, Satan loves that. When you're fighting with your neighbor, he loves that. When nations are fighting, he loves that. He wants to see men at each other's throats. Look what it says in Revelation 16. It speaks of these vile spirits. You don't have to tear near down. We'll go there. 16 verse 14. It says this. For they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And so you see these demon spirits led the heart of Hitler. They were there leading the heart of Hitler. Demon spirits are warmongering spirits that are working in the hearts of people and to move them to destruction and battle between each other. And when you want to know where God is, don't strike out the perversity factor because there is something horrible that's being played out and working out in the hearts of men at this time. And the unsaved, that's ripe and ready, will be deceived. God sends delusion to, for those who have re, uh, refused the Lord. And especially when Satan shows these signs and miracles and powers to the kings and the people. And so when God removes restraint, battles begin. And here's an army of 200 million. Now in World War II, the greatest number of troops the U.S. had under arms was only 2 million. And, the, and, and when John wrote this, I tell you that it, it would have seemed absolutely impossible. But I read in the news magazine back in the 60s that China confessed and announced that they had even put 200 million people under arms. And it's an amazing thing how they use precisely that number that God used here in the book of Revelation. But besides this, the Bible uses the word armies right there. It doesn't in King James in verse 16, but it does in several other books, in several other uh, uh, Bibles, like the American Standard Bible. It says that the number of armies with the horsemen. And so we see actually it's a plural because it says the number of armies. Now the war that's described here, it seems like it's actually a symbolic description of modern warfare, like what I was talking about. But you know, these nations that come together, I don't believe that China comes together until the land time of Armageddon. I believe that this is the Muslim nation's armies and that they could make up 200 million right there coming against with Russia. But it says that they had breastplates of fire of Jason. Now, Jason is the color of a hot blue flame. So we're talking about, when they say Jason, it's talking about fire coming out of a gun. And these instruments of war shoot fire and smoke and brimstone. And they had tails like the tails of serpents. And that sounds very much like modern tanks and helicopters and the tails like serpents, rockets and missiles that we can see today. And you see the tails streaming out of them. Now, can you imagine the Apostle Paul if God said, 
Paul, I want you to describe how man landed on the moon and stuff. And so he would say, well, I saw a great spider issuing forth fire and brimstone. Remember how when they went on the moon, that thing with all those legs was walking along? And hey, it looks like a spider up there. And he'd say, that's what I saw. So right there, God, John is basically looking forward into the future. And of course, nobody knew anything about helicopters and airplanes. And nobody knew anything about tanks and all these things. And, and they didn't even have guns then. Now, they, they knew something about horses prepared for battle, and so ultimately we see that there is a coming of war. But let me give you a scenario. And I'm not saying that this is what's going to happen positively, but I'm saying it may happen. And I can assure you that the things that I'm going to tell you are prophesied, whether that is the point or not. But I want you to see that there is going to rise in Europe, and is arising now, it says, a great nation. And we see the EU is becoming that great coalition union where we're going to have kind of like the United States of Europe and it has turned into that and it's become more and more like Europe and the West are becoming more the same because there is supposed to still be the coalition of power in Europe that takes over and a ruler is going to arise and is going to come gather together out of the military and economic power that has been latent there in Europe. Europe is going to finally get stronger. I don't know, maybe it's when Trump is done or what. I don't know when it could be. I've heard uh, ending times as 2025, 2028, 2017. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we are definitely getting close. Definitely getting close. And we see also the beast and the Antichrist is going to come out of the old revived Roman Empire. I believe that the beast is the Pope. <laughs> Not the beast, excuse me, the false prophet. The false prophet because he is to be the one that is to be in charge of all the religions. And the Catholic Church is wanting to go ahead and make all, bring all the religions together. Right now he's talking about it. In fact, they're the ones that are very familiar with Chrislam. And they don't have a problem with it. And I'm thinking, my goodness, this is just, you can't put Islam and Christianity together unless you rip lots of pages out of both books, that's for sure. But Western units should be reconstructed and stuff. Now, the ruler is going to make a treaty with Israel, and I tell you, the only way out of the problem in the world that's going to come at this time is for a third party to come to power with the authority to say to Israel, come under our wing and we're going to protect you and we'll try to keep your borders safe. And this is where the problem arises, and you know that's probably going to happen, where Western Europe, with the agreement of the United States, could make a treaty with Israel that can unconditionally guarantee the borders. And you know that when that happens, it's going to incite the passions of the Muslim world. I mean, they can't even block it off from the Muslims in Jerusalem. They're like right now having big troubles because they ended up, the Muslims freaked out because they can't stand having any metal detectors there. And so they finally had to take the metal detectors out so the Muslims can come up to the Temple Mount. And it's just nothing but problems there. I, I get the Jewish newspaper and I read about it every day. The Muslim world is completely stretched along the Euphrates River, too. The Muslim, all the Muslim nations control that Euphrates River. It reaches all the way up to southern Russia, uh, the former Soviet Union, and it's there right all the way down. And you can see the Euphrates River right there where it begins. And many of these Muslim nations are going to come together with great resentment, saying, no, we hate you and your covenant with Israel. Iran won't even put Israel on the map. All their maps don't even have Israel there. Because their whole goal, their main thing in their religion is kill Israel. That's what they stand for. And there will come a war, and that will be centered right along the Euphrates from the north and the south. And a horde of 200 million will begin to march. And when this happens, the West that has made a covenant with Israel will come against this horde. And like I said, I don't believe China's involved in this yet. And I believe that it says, like it says in Ezekiel 37, which is 38 and 39, that this northern power will come down, Russia, and it's going to make an alliance with all the others that surround around about Turkey, Iran and the radicals. And right now, Iran has got a place. They're getting themselves all the way with a country all the way to Israel. And they're trying to make a way so they can make their march right across and they're going to be going right across that Euphrates River. And along with this, others will be joining in the battle against Israel. And you ask and you say, well, who will win the battle? Oh, I already know that. Israel. Israel wins. Israel wins. All the battles to come, Israel will win all of them from now on. We don't have to worry about that. The Bible says that sometimes the people will come against Israel and they won't be able to handle them, so God will take care of them, and God will. 
And there is going to come a great shaking, and I mean a great shaking in the land of Israel. Is it going to be an earthquake, or is it going to be an atomic war? Well, we're going to have to see. But out of the West, we know that the West will prevail. Now, we're still in the first three and a half years, so this is not Armageddon yet. However, there will be a ge geopolitical vacuum. And in this geopolitical vacuum, we know that the beast will move in. I don't know who he will be. I sometimes don't believe that he knows who he will be. And he will be approached just like Jesus was approached on the mountain. And he will say, I'll give you all the prince, all the kingdoms of the world and all these people will make a controller of everything if you'll do what I say. And he'll say, okay. And that's how I think. That's why people are always going, do you know who the Antichrist might be? Well, no, I don't. And I don't even think that he knows right now. So now he will be ensconced basically virtually as the world leader and all of the world will wander after the beast because he won this battle. So in this battle, you know, sometimes big, hard, horrible wars can make heroes out of people, you know. And they will say, who is like the beast? This is a quote out of the Bible. Who is able to make war with the beast because he has won this battle? And you say, well, Pastor, when's all this going to happen? Well, I personally believe that's going to happen after God removes the church before the tribulation. We, we get taken out before the tribulation because it's then that God removes his restraining hand with the seals. And he says, let loose the four angels here in the sixth trumpet. And when God says, now it is time to let loose the four beasts, it's time to let them loose. And the man who's wanted to live his own life, his own way, is going to end up following Satan. Because every way that doesn't lead to Christ follows Satan. And he will have this opportunity on the broad path. Because the Antichrist is morally corrupt. And he is going to encourage moral corruption. He will have this opportunity to do it on the broad path. Now, this is the fifth factor that I want to mention right now. It is the pride factor. We're coming to the end here. Now, here is the pride factor. If God's love doesn't bring repentance, God's judgment will bring rebellion. God's judgment will bring... Now, you know, would you think after all of these things, men would fall on their face, and you'd think that they would be crying out to God, saying, Oh, God, have mercy. Look what it says in verse 19. For their power is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails <clears throat> were, were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And by the way, we have missiles called stinger missiles. Look at it, it says in 2021. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands. They didn't repent that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and devils and, and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see or hear or walk, neither repented they of their murderers or their sorceries, nor their fornications, nor their thefts. You would think that man would be horrified, but instead they get hardened. You have seen this in your life too. When you preach the gospel to somebody, they can either come to you and respond to you, or they will be turned off to you. They don't want to hear it at all. And when they do not have the spirit and they are not ripe and ready and stuff, they will rebel against the word of God. I mean, men are not changed because of punishment. You can put a man in prison and it won't change his heart. You can lay a thousand stripes on the back of a pool and the Bible says that it won't change him. You see, men are not beaten into submission. Listen to me. Do you know what people are doing in hell? Jesus said in hell, men are gnashing their teeth. Do you know what gnashing your teeth means? It means to snarl. Arrgh, arrgh. They're gnashing their teeth. But in tribulation, you see, they're not saying, God, have mercy. They're gnashing their teeth against God. And they're saying, God's not fair. Now, I think a lot of unsaved people feel that way. A lot of unsaved people, how could there be a good God and there's all these wars and all these famines and all these sicknesses? Because they don't understand. And so when people don't hear what they want to hear, they can be very rebellious. And here is a world that's under judgment. And they said, it also says that they don't repent of their sorceries, which, of course, is drug use. They're still doing their vile concourse with demons and astrology and Satan worship. And so their sins are Godward and manward, and it includes murder and all the unchristian things, all unchristian living. 
Now the stage is being set, and I tell you today, now in America, the abortion rate is unbelievable. And today we promote our children to disregard life. And God has blessed, we, we have the audacity to sing, God bless America. And then it mentions their sorceries. And do you know what sorcery means? The Greek word is pharmakia. And do you know what pharmacist is? He's a dispenser of drugs. And the word here is for drug use. Now, statistics show that 8 out of 10 people in America are on some kind of habitual drug. 8 out of 10. And it says in the tribulation that man's mind will be reduced to rubble through drugs. But then he mentions fornication. Now, it's a Greek word that we get our word pornographic from. It speaks of sexual perversion and immorality. It speaks of the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. And God left Sodom and Gomorrah with its smoking ruins as a testimony to those afterwards who should live ungodly. So they would remember God's judgment. But, you know, we won't learn. And, you know, if God doesn't punish us, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And I don't think he's going to do that. And in the world, we can expect the same judgment as Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he speaks of their thefts and their crimes because they steal from one another with no restraints whatsoever. So now what I'm trying to say is this punishment and this suffering does not bring people to God. Now, God is righteous, and I tell you, God will bring judgment because he is just. But do you know what really brings people to God? And I mean, what causes people to repent? The Bible says in the book of Romans that it is the goodness of God that leads people to repent. The goodness of God. You know, things that make me cry is when people come to the Lord and things. You know, it's just salvation is such a, a tremendous thing. You know, when you see somebody make that change in their life and, and know that they need the Lord, what a, what a wonderful thing. But what causes people to repent? The repent? Bible says the goodness of God. You see, if bloody Calvary doesn't cause you to bow your knee and give your heart to Jesus Christ, suffering won't do it. All it will do is bring you more and more rebellion. But if the love of God doesn't move your heart, just tell me what can move your heart. God loved us so much. He's done so much for us. He's made a way. He's given us a church. He's given us the word of God to hear. He's given us the seat to sit in church. He's given us a commission to share it with others. He gives us the joy that comes from knowing him. You know, C.F. Lewis said that there is two classes of people in the world. There are those who are like Satan, who say to God the Father, ah, not your will, but my will be done, and stuff. And we see then there's the other class that don't follow Satan, but they follow Jesus, and they're Christians, and they say to God the Father, not my will, but your will be done, thine be done. But everyone here is in one of those two categories, Everyone here in C.S. Lewis says that the first category who says like Satan, saying to the Father, not your will, mine will be done. He says that when they finally drop into hell, a broken-hearted Father will say, gee, not my will, yours be done. It was your choice. And you see, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to, on your outline, repentance. And if you go to hell, now listen, you're going to have to climb over bloody Calvary to get there because God doesn't want you to die and go to hell. However, you can say amen, and you can say to God the Father, not your will, mine be done. But that would be so foolish to do, I mean, for you to choose your own will. I tell you, the wisest thing to do is to give your heart to Jesus. Amen. 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 If you do, you will truly be able to find God in a world gone wild. Yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful that you're helping us dissect Revelation. You told us what a blessing there would be if we would study it. Well, we are. And so, Lord, I, I just pray that you would touch the hearts of the people. It's a hard teaching, Lord, because it's all prophecy. But Lord, I just pray that you would just open everybody's heart up and help them to receive the love that you have for them. Help them to know that it is better to get close to you, Lord, that whenever punishment comes, when we're close to you, it doesn't hurt like it does when we run from you. Lord, just help us to seek you always through everything that we do. Teach us to pray often. Teach us to grow in knowledge, Lord. We understand that we can't learn everything right off the bat, that you've left things in a puzzle in the Bible so we would be able to spend the rest of our lives looking and finding new answers to keep us interested forever. 
that if you gave us all the information right at once, that we would become bored of the word and we would stray away, Lord. There's specific reasons why David said to continue to look in the word of God for those particular gems to put it all together. And that's what we do. And I'm sure, Lord, that's what I'll do until the day you come. But Lord, help me to share it with others and help their minds and their hearts be open so they would receive it, Lord. Whether these are true thoughts or not, help them to open it up and let the Spirit guide each individual into truth and help them to know that we love you, Lord, and that we're trying to give total truth. And so, Lord, we just turn these people over to you. We thank you for the message today. We thank you for how you're working in our lives and in this church. And, Lord, we are growing in knowledge, and we are seeking you with a whole heart. And so we thank you again. We turn this over to you again, Lord, our lives. We ask for these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, we have one last song. If we can stand together, I will release you. We're going to sing a song called, I Want to Serve You, which is kind of a, appropriate for the message today. So here we go. I want to serve you. I want to serve you.